All right, hey, we'll get, we'll get, we'll jump in here. We'll get started. Is this on? It's on. Okay. All right. So, I, I always find it interesting when there's stuff that Pastor talks about and the stuff I talk about kind of go hand in glove. And I thought, oh, perfect. You know, Pastor's preaching. I'm like, I'm glad he consulted me on the sermon. So somewhere in uh, somewhere in Scottsdale, Arizona, of all places, there are tanks filled with liquid nitrogen, and inside those tanks, <laughs> inside those tanks are the bodies and heads of over 200 humans who opted to be cryopreserved, some along with their pets, by the way, with the hopes of being revived in the future. Okay. Customers pay between 80 and $200,000 to have their brain or, e- or even their whole body preserved with the hope that in the future, medical technology will allow them to be revived, right? And what might have been fatal in our time will be nothing more than a medical inconvenience in the future, and they will have the opportunity to go on living healthy and normal lives. It's kind of like when you watch, uh, like, I remember, I watch Star Trek, and they always talk about, yeah, 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 people used to die from cancer. It's crazy. You know, and that's, this is the idea. This is what they're hoping for and longing for. And, and, and besides the, the, these people that are already in stasis, and it raises so many questions, besides these people already in stasis, another 1,400-plus people have signed up for the program pending their demise. And they have a rapid response team that should you pass away, they will come and put your body through this whole process and then stick you in one of these, one of these uh, coolers. For a while. Okay. According to their former CEO, he said, so they're not really dead. They're just legally dead. <laughs> Which sounds like some movie I watched one time. Um, he says, they're mostly dead. It puts, it puts di- this is what they said. It puts dying on a pause and it lets you go into the future where we have greater capabilities to reverse that and bring you back to life. Boy, you want to talk about gambling, right? Sure hope this works. Now, I've, like I said, it raises so many questions for me, like power outages. Anyway, that's okay. Look, I think, the idea, I think the idea that people would choose to submit to what amounts to experimental technology really, really uh, demonstrates that people are willing to do almost anything to avoid facing death. And there is, of course, a possibility that they will never be revived and, and their bodies will remain in storage for as long as there is power to maintain this facility. But it also speaks to this bigger issue. What do you do? Now, when you have nothing to look forward to after death, what, what steps would you take when you believe that this life is all there is? And what would you do if the answer to your, to your question is what happens when I die is nothing? You might resort to some of these types of ideas. Now, as Christians and just as people, we have to come to grips with this question as well. And over the last, over the last month, just the last month, I've been faced with the reality of death in some very, very real ways. Um, an oboe? What is... I'm like, that's not me. I thought I turned off the... Okay. Whew, just checking. Okay. Mariachi band. Hey, you know, Cinco de Mayo. That's right. Okay, whatever. <laughs> like, why do I want a taco all of a sudden? Okay. Um, all right. Good, we needed that break. It's a lot of heavy stuff here. Look, as Christians and as people, we have to deal with these questions and come to, you know, so over the last month, I have, I have been faced with the reality of death in very, very real ways. I, I sat with a family as their mother took her last breaths. I sat with a friend who knew his body was shutting down. The doctor gave him only days to live. He knew it. We knew it. We knew, we knew it was our last conversation. I'd like to think that we made it count. And there have been constant reminders of the reality of, of death. And even this past week, you know, I spoke to a number of people who are wrestling with the passing of a loved one. Even today, we've been touched by this passing of a loved one. And someone once said, right, that the only guarantees in life are death and taxes. But guess what? Some people know how to get out of their taxes, don't they? No one escapes death. But as Christians, as Christians, this question, the answer to the question, what happens when I die, does not have to be a mystery. It should not be a mystery. In fact, the Bible is very clear. And so Paul addresses it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which is the book we're studying. And he says here, For we know, he says, when this earthly tent, what we live in, is taken down, that is, when we die, when we leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not by human hands. We grow weary 
in our present bodies. For, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies, uh, and we will not be spirits without bodies. And while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and we sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to, be, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. He says, God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. And so we are confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are, we are not at home with the Lord, for we live by believing and not by seeing. And he says, yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. Now, there is two things that as Christians, as believers, that we should always be anticipating, and it's this. And I don't want to separate them. We should be anticipating our death and our resurrection. These are two very real realities for every Christian, for every believer. Our death and our resurrection. That's what he's talking about here. And the reason that believers should not fear death is because we believe, we know, as he says, it is not the end of our life. It's just the end of these mortal, physical bodies. There is a distinct difference. See, Christianity teaches that humanity consists of what? Of body and soul, the material and the immaterial. And at death, at the time where we're no longer breathing, at the time that our body shut down, those two things are separated for a time. And then at the resurrection, these two things are united for eternity. And so imagine, here's how I want to put it to you. Imagine you are living in an old house, right? Which is falling apart. Some of you woke up and said, yes, this old house is falling apart. Okay, you live in this old house, it's falling apart, this is your home but the reality that it's crumbling down around you, and you, it, 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 the reality is that it's crumbling down around you, and you can't keep up the maintenance, right? It's dilapidated, the roof is falling in, it leaks. But there's a contractor who specializes in home remodels, so he promises to fix his house up so you can live in it forever. But you just have to move out for a while. But, but where to go? Where do you go while the contractor is doing this? Well, this contractor, he won't leave you homeless. So he lets you move into his house for a while until your rebuilt home is ready. Okay? So you have this broken down house, and at death we're separated from that. We move into the contractor's house who prepares for us a new home and rebuilds it. So in a similar fashion, at death, our soul temporarily dwells with God until the time of the resurrection where you and I will be reunited with our now glorified bodies. Now, I don't know what that experience is going to be like, specifically uh, what it's going to be like from us from our last breath in this body and our first breath in our resurrected body. But we do know this from the scripture that we will be in the presence of God. Okay, that is a promise. We'll be in the presence of God. He says here, in, 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 maybe you've heard this passage in the old King James, it says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body. When my, my soul and my body are separated, I will be in the presence of the Lord. And there are some who believe in soul sleep, right? That we won't be aware of anything until the time of the resurrection, that you'll, you'll fall asleep and you'll wake up, kind of like when you, you maybe some of you have done that and you, wake, you fall asleep on the couch and, and you wake up and you're in your, you know, what just happened, right? You don't, you don't have no, every one of those, like those dreamless nights of sleep and it's just a trip and you're like, why is it light outside, okay? But that's, just, that's what some people think is going to happen. But we know this though, we know that Jesus made a promise to the thief on the cross, that he would be with Jesus in paradise. And, and there are some that believe that the parable of the rich man and Lazarus was more than just simply a story. And I believe if we look at scripture that there is an awareness after death and for the believer, a conscious reality of the presence of God. And so we know that after we die, we will be with God. We'll be in the presence of God. And that is an exciting prospect, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Would that entirely look like? I don't know. Not many people have come back to talk about it. Okay? And... You know, you kind of feel for Lazarus, like he's with, he's, he's with God for three or four days, and then, like, they wake him up. He's like, oh, man. <laughs> Everyone else was happy. Lazarus was like, okay. I mean, all right. So what does Paul do? What Paul does here is he gives us what we can expect to look forward to for eternity. And Pastor has been talking about this. He's been talking about the millennial kingdom. He's been talking about this. But there's a couple things that we need to know that after this we can have to look forward to because we know that when our body is separated from our soul, our soul goes to be with the Lord, but eventually they're reunited. So for us, death is not the end. The resurrection, because we have to anticipate our death and the resurrection, what does that mean? Well, the first thing we, we know we're going to have is we're going to have a permanent body. A permanent body. What does that mean? Well, he says here, we know 
that when this earthly tent, our bodies, is, is, is taken down, that, we, it, that is, when we die and we leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. We long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. And like he says, for we will put on these heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. And it's important to point out what he, that last thing he says in verse 3, that we will put on heavenly bodies and not be spirits. And I think people like to imagine that we'll just float around in heaven. But heaven, this eternal state that's promised in the book of Revelation, is a real physical place that will occupy a real physical earth. It will last forever, and so we must exist in bodies that will also last forever. That's why it's called eternal life. And I want you to see how Paul contrasts our body now with what we will have. He says we're moving from a tent <laughs> to a, what, a house, right? You ever spent a long time in a tent? gets old after a while. Like camping is great. I love camping. I also like sleeping not on the floor. All right. And so I have a friend of mine who spent uh, the last year, he said, I'm going to save some money. He had this temporary assignment. He got himself a tiny house and he's so over it. You know, like after like six months, he's like, why did I commit to this? It's cramped. It's tiny. He doesn't have a bathroom. He doesn't have a shower. You know, he said, every time it rains, the water likes to come down through the light fixture. You know, and he, so he now, so he, he got out of his assignment, and he went and bought a house. He's like, oh, so nice, you know, can like spread out, put his arms on either side and not touch the walls. It's good. It's an improvement. So here's what he's saying. Like, we're going from a tent to a house, temporary to permanent. We're transitioning from a body, he says here, formed by biology to one crafted by God himself, which is great. Our old clothes are worn out, so we're getting new ones that don't. In, in, in the previous chapter, Paul said that our outer man is wasting away, but our new bodies will not have the same limitations. And, and then in 1 Corinthians, he says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? He says, you foolish person, what you sow, this is key right here. This is 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about the resurrection. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. All right? And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel perhaps a wheat or of some other grain. And then he goes on later, he says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown, this body is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. So death happens, what? When our bodies can no longer serve the functions required for life, right? Legal death, and there's no brain activity, there's no heart activity. But in our new bodies, that's never going to be an issue because our bodies won't just be permanent, our bodies will also be perfect. We're going to have a perfect body. I'm kind of excited about this one myself. He says, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and we sigh. Anybody groan and sigh in these earthly bodies? Okay. And he says, look, it's not that we don't want to die, right? Because I think that's normal to say, I don't want to die. And we don't want to get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. Can you imagine a body that will not die? That, but, that, but that continues to experience the aches and pains and shortcomings of this mortal existence? That, doesn't, that wouldn't be cool. Hey, good news, you get to live for eternity, but you're still going to be in pain all the time. Ooh. <laughs> right? No, we don't want to just live forever. We want to live forever in perfection. The bodies made by God will not have the same issues as the body made by biology. I would not want to go through eternity with a limp. Right? We won't be raised to life in the same physical state we were in when we died. Again, back in 1 Corinthians, Paul told the church, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We won't all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. That sounds amazing. And he says, for this perishable must put on imperishable, imperishable, the mortal body was put on immortality and when that perishable puts on the imperishable the mortal puts on immortality then shall come to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory death where is your victory, O death where is your sting, again, again what pastor was talking about that we will not wear out right, we won't wear out we won't break down, we won't fall apart we'll be in perfect bodies and look Death is part of sin in our life. And so when you think that sin has been removed, right, then that which in us which dies will not be there. And, and what does a perfect body look like? Well, uh, <laughs> to be honest, it's kind of hard to imagine what that looks like. 
But the Apostle Paul, he gives us some insight. He says this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and yet what we will be has not yet appeared. But we do know that when he, Jesus, appears, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. And what was Jesus like? Great question. Well, John MacArthur's got some good thoughts here. He says, from Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, we get some idea of the greatness and the power and the wonder of what our own resurrection body will be like. Jesus appeared and he disappeared at will. He reappeared again at another place far distant. He could go through walls or closed doors. And yet, he could eat and drink and sit and talk and be seen by those who he wanted to see him. He was remarkably the same and yet even more remarkably different. And just as with our Lord, our bodies, which are now perishable, dishonored and weak and natural, will be raised into bodies that are imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual. That's pretty cool. If my body is going to be like Christ's body, it's pretty cool what it could be like, right? I'm, I'm kind of excited to see that. And because it's his power that resurrects us from the dead, it will be Christ's glory in us. It will be his power in us. Right, And look, Christ was what? The first fruits of the resurrection. And as his physical body was raised, so shall ours be raised, and we'll have an eternal state like him. That'll be pretty cool. We don't know what he's like, but we'll see it, and that's what we're going to be like. You know? And I like the idea of being able to go through walls and eat whenever I want to. So it's kind of, it works out. Now, when you consider the life, look, look, and when you consider the life and the work of Jesus and all the people he healed, that was just a picture of the kingdom of heaven. Think about all the lives Christ touched when he, he healed people and he healed them of their illness and their sickness, that God can take broken bodies and make them whole. Then at the resurrection, our bodies will be redeemed and renewed just as our spirits were at the point of salvation. With that which is broken in us, that which is a result of sin or damage to our bodies won't matter. And our bodies, like our spirits, they bear the marks of the wounds of a sinful and fallen world. But God will take and, and reclaim our bodies and heal our bodies that, and make them that bodies are fit and designed for eternity. And since death and illness and decay is a result of sin in the world, our bodies, cleaned of all the marks of sin, will not die perfect and permanent. Sounds pretty good to me. All right? Here's something that we need to remember, though. And Pastor said this today. He says, eternal life begins at the moment of salvation. And after Lazarus dies, Jesus is speaking to his sister Martha. He tells her, he says, I, I am the resurrection and the life that whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And, who, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Cool. It's pretty great. And so for Christians... Death is nothing more than a speed bump, and God is already preparing us for eternity. So let's talk about this divine, this divine preparation. Like God's getting you ready for eternity even now. He says, God has prepared, him, has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us the Holy Spirit. Right? So the Holy Spirit's already working out eternity in our hearts. He's beginning the process of transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. He's renewing our minds and hearts in preparation for our new bodies. And it's the Holy Spirit that makes us dissatisfied with this world, so we're going to long for the next one. It's the Holy Spirit that keeps us from coming, becoming complacent with what this world has to offer and allows us not to fear death because we know that in God's timing, better waits for us. And so because of God's preparation, death will not shock us. And if anything, for those fortunate enough to live to old age, we will actually find a blessed peace in knowing what awaits us immediately after we die. You know, it might come as a surprise to you, but there are people who actually welcome death. There are believers who welcome death in their old age. And, and it's, not because, it's not because they have lost hope and no longer wish to live. It's because they have eternal hope. All right? I have aging in-laws who long for heaven, not because, they, you know, because they're at a point where they know what awaits them. They're ready. They're, they, they, they're ready to go to the Lord. Now, they're not going to help anything along the way, but they're like, God, when he, you want to take us home, I'm not going to break my heart because we have an eternal hope and they want to enter into their eternal rest. And faced with the impermanence and frailty of our own mortality, the renewal of the resurrection is really something to look forward to. And, 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 and this is what Paul talked about to Timothy in his final letter. Look what he says. He says, I am, I, am, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Like, I did the work, so whatever God wants to take me, 
I know there's something waiting for me. So for Christians, death is not only expected, but a necessity that leads to greater things. And knowing we'll die and what awaits us in death transforms the way we live and gives us a very powerful confidence. And he says we are always confident, though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord because we live by faith and not by sight. And so what Paul says, look, we, he begins this passage of Scripture with this common phrase, we know, we know, we don't think, we don't hope, we know that if this tent is destroyed, we have a building made from God waiting for us. Imagine the freedom that comes with knowing, that comes with knowing that the outcome is the same no matter what. Consider that you can live confidently because death is no longer the worst thing that can happen to you, right? You ever think about that? Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. So you can live your life unafraid. Paul didn't have to be afraid that his service to the Lord would end in death and thus keeping him from this life of value and significance. In fact, he knew his service to the Lord would end in death, meaning he could live boldly and powerfully with the knowledge that when he was done living the life God had for him, his reward waited. In the meantime, he would live like heaven was promised and and that his reward was guaranteed. And so death was not a threat. And I think sometimes we're afraid of doing things for the Lord because of what might happen. We're afraid to get on that plane. We're afraid to go on that trip. We're afraid to leave our house. We're afraid because what could happen? What happened? You know, Pastor, t- <laughs> Pastor talked about this guy who's taking all these pills and treatments and doing all these things for long his life. And Kristen leans over to me and says, it only, it's only going to take one bus. <laughs> right? You could do, you could take all the pills in the world and to prolong your life. And you know what? You're going to get on, you're going to get on the wrong plane someday. You're going to cross the wrong intersection. It's all it takes. I've had people talk about, you know, you know what? Oh, you know, you're going to Alaska on these mission trips. You get in this small plane. God doesn't need a small plane to take me out. T- I live in El Cajon. God does not need a small plane <laughs> to take me. I pray every time I drive to work you know, in the intersection. Okay, and it's just like, okay, crossing the street. Like, all right. So why not, knowing that God has numbered my days, go out faithfully, knowing that what awaits me. Because what's the worst that can happen? Is it death? Is it really? Not when this waits on me. Paul told the Philippian church, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will will be at all, that that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now as always Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And you know what that verse says? He's like, my life is Christ. And if I die, guess what? More Jesus. Win-win. And if I am to live... Uh, and, and if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I, 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 he says, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart, to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convince of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy and faith. In other words, we're going to keep going. Paul kept going until God told him otherwise. People said, hey, if you go to Rome, you're going to die. He's like, okay, but I'm going to go to Rome with the confidence that God has sent me there, and I'm going to proclaim the gospel to Caesar, which he did. Pretty cool, all right? We keep going until in this life until God tells us otherwise, confident in what awaits us. We don't need to fear death. We don't need to freeze ourselves, hoping for a better future, and we don't need to worry about what this life does to us since our eternal and resurrected life will redeem and restore us. And unless I be accused of glorifying death, And I don't want anybody to think, why are you saying we should just get there sooner? Or if you think that I'm presenting uh, death as a solution and an option to a hard life, let me say this. Let's talk about suicide. Let's get this phrase off the table. Here it is. Suicide is not a shortcut to eternal reward. But it shortchanges the transformative work God wants to do in your life. Okay? I want you to hear that. Because we think about death, well, this is what's waiting for me. Maybe I should just go there now. Life is hard. No. No. God wants to do transformative things in, in your life and, 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 and do that through the pain, through the hardship, through the difficulty, knowing fully well that on the other side of it, God will, God's glory will be revealed and you will be stronger and God's going to do transformative work in your life. There's an, old, there's an old Latin phrase, maybe you've heard. It says, memento mori. Remember, forgive the spelling error, remember that you will die. Okay? Great. And we could look at this morbidly Losing hope, claiming as the author of Ecclesiastes did that everything is meaningless, right? Vanity of vanities. Everything is meaningless. What's the point? Or we can take it as a reminder to make this life count, knowing 
that a life lived for God and lived for others will matter in this life and the next. Some people say, remember, you're going to die. Guess it doesn't really matter. Or, haha, <laughs> you can do this. You could say, memento vivere. Remember to live. Remember to live, right? What does that mean? Well, in Psalm 90, he says, teach us to number our days. Know that death is a reality so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Okay? If you know you're going to die, that doesn't mean give up. That means make this life count. Live for the Lord. In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you've already died once. You know that? You've already, you're already dead. Dead man walking. Once you're dead, what do you have to fear? He says here, uh, because once you know you've already died, you get to really live. Colossians 3.3 3 says you have died with Christ. You have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Okay, a very efficient way of death. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You've already died. So start to live. That's what he's saying. Well, okay. So what? So Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin is buried at Christ Church burial ground in, in, in Philadelphia. And among his many roles in life, besides being one of the you know, you know, founding father, uh, he was the inventor and scientist, a newspaper pub- editor, printer, book publisher. In 720, 1720, he's 22 years old, Benjamin Franklin wrote what he hoped would be his own epitaph. And here's what he wrote. Uh, he said, the body of, of B. Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding lies here, food for worms, but the work shall not be wholly lost. For it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. Looking forward to the second edition of all of this. Well, what happens after we die? Well, after we die, we enter into the presence of the Lord. We experience the eternal rest of those who place their faith in Christ. And someday our spirit will be reunited with our glorified, transformed, permanent, and perfected body prepared for all eternity. And so we focus today, we focus today on, on what happens to believers when they die because this is what we have to look forward to. And, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention what happens to unbelievers. What happens to them? Well, the simple truth is they don't have anything to look forward to. So what do they do? They freeze themselves, right? They prolong death. They, they, they're looking for something else, right? And none of the hopeful promises made to believers applies to them. The Bible teaches, yes, they will undergo a resurrection. The truth is all of us, everyone, living person who dies will undergo a resurrection, but their experience will not be the same. Daniel actually hints at this in Daniel chapter 12. He says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the point is this, and here's what I want you to take away. What happens when we die is decided by the choice we make in this life. Do we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? He is the only way to heaven. He's the only way any of us are getting out of here truly alive. And I want to challenge us with that. And this is why we share the gospel with people, because death will be a very different experience for those who don't know Jesus. And maybe that's why people try to cheat death, right? To, they have nothing to look forward to. So we don't have to be frozen to look forward to a better future. And we know that someday in death, we'll be in the presence of God, permanent, perfect bodies. And let's take Paul's word to and his advice to walk by faith and not by sight and make sure that knowing what happens after you die changes the way we live. Amen? All right, Father, we're grateful for the day, grateful for the word. 